Why don't we uh, get started? I'm Professor Tom McNair. I think most of you know me. I'm visiting Professor SSP. You don't probably associate me with energy security, which is probably a fair thing to say, but way back in the 1980s when I was at the Brookings Institution, I wrote a book on military strategy in the Persian Gulf, and I had to learn energy economics, and I just kept an eye on it ever since, so that's the relevant background here. Uh, my colleague today is Professor Kaz Yost, who's now over at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. He actually ran the Institute for 12 years and then went into the, the National Intelligence Council, the NIC, for four years as the director of the Strategic Futures Group. But he also, you know, he was telling me, he, he gets out of, he's a Georgetown grad, goes into banking in the Middle East for seven or eight years. When I met him, longer ago than we probably want to discuss, he was on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Then he went off to NGOs, and he can tell you about that if you want. In other words, it's, a, it's a, a, you know, kind of a classic Georgetown University SFSF or MSFS career in private public sector jobs. Anyway, we were asked to be part of a panel at, uh, on a conference sponsored by CCAS here in, on campus. The title, An, an Energy Revolution? Question mark. Political Ecologies of Shale Oil in the Middle East, the United States, and China. And, and we, we were on the last panel, Policy Implications, and we followed a day and a half of briefings or presentations all over the place, but a lot of them dealt either <coughs> with the technical dimensions of fracking or the economic dimensions of fracking on oil and gas markets. And since we, you know, you don't have the rest of the conference to, to give you that <coughs> background before we speak, let me, let me, let, let us sort of introduce you to the very basics of fracking and what it's done to the energy markets. Uh, and, and, uh, if you ask questions, Cass will answer all of them. <laughs> okay, and then, then Cass will speak about the broad strategic, well, strategic futures in a way as we comprehend change. I'll focus in more on what I wrote about 30 some years ago, which is the Persian Gulf, why it's still important, and how we, uh, how we think about security uh, in that region, okay? So this is a, a child's drawing of fracking. You all, you all know what this looks like. There's really two innovations here. One is very deep vertical, and the other is horizontal drilling. Put them together. That took a few years. <laughs> Get a lot of water, which has chemicals in it, the identities of which we don't really know because they're proprietary. You pump it down there, blow it up, and you get oil, or gas, or both. Uh, it, unlike typical oil drilling like the Saudis where you drill a well and it just keeps delivering for years and years, right, because you've got a big pool of oil. Uh, here, the well goes, you know, it peaks and then it goes dry and you go and you build another well. So there's a constant kind of a cycle of <coughs> drill, do something with what comes up, it goes down to nothing and then go move on. Uh, this is what one of those things looks like. This is a beautiful lake of polluted water. By the way, we, we won't talk about the, I'm not an environmentalist, neither is Cass. I'm, there's grave environmental concerns about fracking, and I, I'm sympathetic with those, but I'm just not qualified to, to talk about it. So save those questions. Oh, I, I should also say, this is off the record. If, uh, uh, if you want to talk to us, come see us, shoot us an email, and we'll talk about it. But uh, especially Cass, who was just in the intelligence community until last year, uh, probably just as well to keep it off the record. Uh, there's where shale is in the United States. Actually, this, this map misses the Eagle Ford shale, which is all along the, the <coughs> southwestern border of Texas, no doubt laps into Mexico, but the Mexicans haven't exploited it. We, we are. This is the one you hear about the most, Bakken. That's a lot of oil there. Uh, it, it counts for North Dakota's population going from 10 to about 50 in the last five years. Uh, huge increase in population. Now they're all leaving, right, because the price of oil. This, this is the Marcellus, Marcellus shell. These all have crazy names. I don't know where they came from. Uh, and unless you live in New York, if you own a farm in Pennsylvania and somebody comes up and says, can I drill and I'll give you a certain amount of money, you're free to do that. So you'll, you'll find, aside from New York, which just voted a few I guess a month ago or two, 
to, to ban fracking. Uh, in Pennsylvania, Ohio, a lot of fracking going on there. A lot of gas, I think, coming out of there. So Bakken, Eagle Ford, Marcellus are probably the ones you hear about the most, but it's all over the place. Uh, this is uh, U.S. crude oil production. This is the better picture here. This starts in 65 and goes through 2013. And you can see this is where the, you know, 2010, and it shoots up. Uh, 2014 was an even better year. That line shot up a lot further. In fact, I think yes, one that our, our incremental increase in production last year was the largest in the world. Right. Uh, the Saudis own most of those trophies for biggest increments in production. We're starting to take a few of them. Just, just to point on this, this is sort of the late 60s. Yeah. I remember this all too well, but you don't. But anyway, in the late 60s, Texas is really the Saudi Arabia. It's the swing state. It has so much oil that, that it can raise or lower its oil production, and, and that kind of affects price. Okay. In the late 60s, discoveries in the United States began to shrink. Demand continued to rise. So all of our production pretty much was used, and power over the price of oil flows to the Saudis. At the time when I was writing, we called Saudi Arabia a low absorber state. Lots of oil, lots of production, relatively small population. So if, if the Saudis want to raise or lower their production by two or even three million barrels a day, if they feel so inclined, they can do that. Texas can't anymore. So in this particular period, between 67 and 73, power really moves to the Gulf. And of course, we respond. I mean, that's really the beginning of our, our deep concern about the Gulf. The Shah falls in 79, and CENTCOM comes into uh, being in 83, and the rest is history. Our production tapers off until fracking, so oil, oil production is going up. Uh, that's just another. OK, this I, you know, this, I think, is a 2013 slide, and, and you probably can't read it from the back of the room. So the, the big spikes here are Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Russia. Those are the three big producers in 2013. To me, the more interesting parts of this graph uh, where's Venezuela? Yeah, Venezuela, is, you can't see the, the line, but it's a very, you know, Venezuela has either the largest reserves or Large, the second largest, 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 reserves. largest reserves. And, you know, what happens when you don't invest in your oil technologies? <laughs> your production goes down. And that's what's happened with the Chavez regime. They're using oil money to buy the people, in a sense, but they're not using, they're not plowing that money back into investment. And that was true of Mexico until last year when they chose to deregulate their oil. And Mexico is right here. I would expect that bar to start going up because the big majors will come in and start to drill. And you'll, do, you'll see deep, deep uh, drilling in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And so Mexico, uh, Mexican production will go up. Uh, just, uh, I'm not sure this, I don't agree with the scale here. I just, I just put the, this is world crude oil production and this is the US and Canada. And I, I just do this to show that despite all the euphoria about fracking, you know, we're still, there's, there's about 93 million barrels of oil produced every day in the world. And we, <coughs> last year, were up around, what, 8.4? Uh, we buy, by the way, we, we buy most of our oil from Canada. We've never bought a lot of oil from Saudi Arabia. Why should you do that when Canada is right across the border? We buy a lot from Mexico. Saudi Arabia is in there too, but we've never been a huge importer from Saudi Arabia. And it's just to give you some perspective, there's a lot of oil production elsewhere in the world, uh, and not just the Persian Gulf. There's gas. Okay, and it starts creeping up. I actually think you know, the, the title of this conference was an energy revolution question mark. I'm going to suggest that oil fracking is not the revolution people think it is. But Cass and I agree that natural gas may be the real revolutionary story here, and he'll, he'll deal with that. Uh, this just tells you where it comes from. These are the different uh, shale fields. The, the, the green is Marcellus. Uh, this light blue is, is Eagle Ford. What else? Most of it's from Texas. Uh, but, you know, Marcellus is Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Ohio. Uh, this is uh, our energy consumption going out to 2035. It's about two years old. Kaz sent me a, a BP 
study that's just a, less than a month old, I think, right? Which takes a little different cut, but, but I, what I wanted to show with this is that oil consumes, it's about a third, roughly speaking, a third of our energy consumption is oil. Uh, and that stays roughly the same. Uh, gas will actually get, on this chart, gas uh, stays the same, which is a little, I think probably it will rise. The thing is, gas actually displaces coal, not oil, at least not, not so much oil as, as coal. Uh, and so we actually use less coal going forward as a percentage. Remember, all of these percentages are against the backdrop of continued economic growth, and, and economic growth breeds uh, uh, more energy requirements. Okay, so oil continues to be a pretty substantial part of our energy mix looking out 20 years into the future. Uh, this is a, another way of looking at that. The red here is, this is 2013, according to this chart, and I think this is the uh, Energy Information Agency. Uh, petroleum, about 36% of our energy in 2013 was, was petroleum, 27 was natural gas, 18, 19 was, was coal. I will talk a little about China. This is China. The blue is coal. This is why you can't breathe very well in Shanghai and Beijing and never see the sun. I mean, I used to travel to China a lot. And it was always nice to see blue sky when I finally got home. 18% uh, oil, so China is a huge energy import, uh, oil importer, and, and that fraction is going up. But its place in China's economy so far is a lot less than oil's percentage of our, our energy mix. Okay. Uh, this is China's energy consumption by choice, I suppose, the, by, by source. I suppose the most important thing is how sharply it's been going up. Uh, that's coal, the red. Uh, this is oil. Uh, and natural gas is very small in there. Uh, and do you want to do, do you want to talk about that, or do you no, want me go to go ahead? Okay. You know this this is the BP study looking <coughs> forward to 2035. Where is there potentially recoverable shale oil and gas? And, and the answer is a lot of it in North America, and that includes Mexico and Canada, not just the United States. Uh, but the big the big winner here is Asia. And, and, it, and it raises the question, you know, I mean, if you're China, you can't breathe in your cities, wouldn't you like to be raising natural gas here? They have, they have shale, a lot of shale, but there's, there's several requirements for fracking to succeed. You know, the, the, the shale in China, there's some of it along the coast, a lot of it's back up in the Gobi. You need lots of water. There isn't any back up there. You need lots of infrastructure, trucks and roads to get in and then pipelines to come out. Uh, they don't have any of that where the good shale is. Uh, but I think the bigger, the bigger issue for China and a lot of other countries, we, the United States may be the only, <coughs> one of the few countries in the world where if, if you own this mythical farm in Pennsylvania, you know, you own a wedge that goes down, I presume, to the center of the earth. You own the resources under your farm. So if a, a fracking firm comes in, you can cut a private deal with that firm unless the state outlaws it like New York did, and you can get a certain amount of money for letting those people frack. In China and a lot of Europe, you know, in China the state owns everything, right? And, and that, there's no incentive for a fracker, you know, a wildcatter from Texas, let's go to China and do some fracking, there's, because it's not clear who, well, it is pretty clear who gets the profits, and it's not the fracking firm. So there's no... There's a lot of political and legal adjustment that has to be accomplished in China. Now, I've gone, I used to go to China a lot. They're aware of this. In fact, I think China is aware of all of its problems. The issue is how do we fix them? So they're working on this. But the BP study actually is pretty pessimistic about China actually getting to the shale. But imagine if they do, and, and suddenly natural gas begins to become a more a larger part of their energy mix. Uh, half the carbon, dis you know, uh, 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 products of, of, of coal and oil, it would really clean up the environment a good bit. Not as much as environmentalists would want. Okay. Uh, now, Kaz is going to take this and paint a big strategic picture, right? <laughs> and then I'll come in and just talk about little stuff. <laughs> 
So I think I'll start with the National Intelligence Council, or I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, so I think that's perhaps where I should begin the story. Uh, the National Intelligence Council, my landlord was the director of CIA, but my boss was the, uh, was the director of National Intelligence, then Denny Blair, Admiral Denny Blair. And Admiral Blair called me up in uh, June of, no, in March of 2009 and said, I want to offer you a dream job. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, I would like you to be the new director for the Strategic Futures Group, actually then called the Long Range Analysis Unit, at the National Intelligence Council. And uh, I thought for a nanosecond, and then I said yes. Um, and that <coughs> job within the National Intelligence Council, we were, I was paid by my government for four years to think about the future um, and to uh, put those thoughts into uh, intelligence products as, uh, as asked for by our consumers downtown and the White House and agencies of government. Um, and as part of my due diligence, I sat down with each one of my staff and said, what's on your mind? I had a staff of roughly 15 senior analysts from across the intelligence community. And this guy named Rich Engel, a retired Air Force <coughs> Major General, <coughs> comes in to me and he says, Cass, we need to be thinking about unconventional gas and oil. <coughs> and I nodded wisely. Um, and uh, Work on that. Get yeah. that nod. That wise nod. Get that down. Get the, get the nod right. And I nodded wisely and uh, said uh, uh, cautiously, well, Rich, tell me more. What's this all about? <laughs> and uh, the story that he unfolded was the fracking story. Uh, U.S. oil production in uh, 2008 was 5 million barrels a day. Um, and um, our gas production was headed south. And in comes this guy by the name of George Mitchell, not the former senator, but a wildcatter. Uh, and George Mitchell figured out how to make fracking profitable. Um, and with a little federal money, federal research support, uh, but mainly on his own, he began this energy revolution. And Rich Engel, my uh, energy guy, said, we need to start paying attention to this. And so we began to tell folks in the White House that, that they ought to be paying attention to it because it had the potential uh, to transform the U.S. energy picture. And the rest uh, is history, as they say. Uh, in 20, remember in, uh, in 2008, U.S. Uh, petroleum production was 5 million barrels a day. By 2014, uh, uh, U.S. petroleum pro crude production had gone up to 8.6 million barrels a day, projected this year to go up to 9.3 uh, million barrels a day. So a trajectory like this, and gas even steeper. Um, and um, that had multiple benefits, but not the least of which on the consumption side. So the U.S. <laughs> Energy Administration, EIA, says in February of 2015, the share of total U.S. liquid fuel consumption met by net imports fell from 60% in 2005 to an estimated 27% in 2014. EIA expects the net import share to decline to 20% in 2016, which would be the lowest level since 1968. So applying the word revolution to this is not a, not a misnomer. Understand the context. Rich Engel comes to me in 2009, and what's going on in 2009? 
<clears throat> we're in the depth of a financial crisis that we'll see Lehman Brothers uh, go out of business. Um, we're getting out of Iraq. Uh, the Afghan surge will come in 2009, uh, but basically in excess of 100,000 U.S. troops in the Middle East being drawn down. Um, and to put it delicately, the U.S. brand in 2009, global brand, is in the toilet. Not just in the toilet because of broad objections to what we were doing in Iraq in particular, uh, but also because our economy was in the tank. And so you can imagine when we briefed what was going on in the energy markets in the sit room in the White House, there was a lot of interest around the table. And what I discovered was all I had to do was put energy on a memo and uh, uh, the National Security Advisor wanted to see that, uh, uh, that memo. Uh, so what, what are uh, the long-term implications? I'm going to talk about the long-term implications of what's going on, um, and then uh, uh, talk about some of the current winners and losers, and then talk specifically about what this means for U.S power and interest. I begin with a cautionary note. Don't look at energy in isolation. So if you go in CIA now, there's an energy group and they've got a bunch of energy wonks and all they can think about is energy and you know what's going on in this energy market, what's going on in that energy market. Um, but as analysts, I caution you not to put energy in a box. Energy is part of a broader phenomenon. When you're looking at a, a country's future, you need to figure out what the, what the variables are that, uh, um, uh, that can be consequential. Uh, so one phenomenon that is making a difference and making a significant difference is that OPEC and its wisdom drove up prices. And the result of that was uh, to get everybody around the world, in Africa, and uh, North Sea, and Latin America, North America, everybody looking for alternative sources. And so what has happened is that uh, production um, has, uh, uh, has exploded. Uh, um, Angola, which never used to produce, is producing. Um, Nigeria, um, just across the board. Um, so uh, all of that production together, uh, including U.S. production, has uh, uh, had the practical effect of, of driving down prices. Uh, but the new story um, is low prices. And if, they, <coughs> uh, if those low prices endure, will it kill off uh, this... Uh, uh, the spreading, uh, um, uh, spreading production. Um, and that, um, that's the story that remains to be told. We're in the middle of it, literally right in the middle of it now. Uh, the U.S. rigs in production around the United States are down by 30% from last fall. Uh, so you would think offhand, it's a no-brainer. Uh, Saudis are going to drive us out of business because they're not cutting production and so uh, prices have gone down and we're, uh, um, we're left uh, uh, with rigs that are no longer uh, competitive. But that's only part of the story. Uh, another part of the story, and that's why I urge you to think of what the different variables are, another part of the story <coughs> is technology. And what technology is doing is to drive the costs of fracking down. So uh, I heard Dan Jurgen the other day uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, what was going on in the U.S. Uh, market. And someone said, all right, Dr. Jurgen, tell us what you think the break-even number is for, uh, um, for um, and fracking operation in the United States to be competitive. And he said, oh, 
for at least 50% of, of the market, it's $60. So not $50, not $40, which we've been down to, but not $115, which is what we were at in June of last year. So that argues that there's a sweet spot in the 60 or $70 dollar range uh, where the U.S. energy market continues to be competitive, uh, albeit at, at lower prices, uh, which argues, and this is what EIA is projecting, that there may be some dip in U.S. production, but the tra trajectory will continue uh, to be up. But if technology is a factor, another factor is demand, economics. Um, and the story today is that Europe isn't growing, Japan isn't growing, uh, China's growth has slowed, gone from 20 years of 10% per annum growth down to 7%, maybe headed south of that. <clears throat> and China was the country that was driving up demand. So uh, uh, look at the, at the economic side. When you're projecting out, think about what, uh, uh, what, uh, um, what global demand um, is apt to be. Conflict. You guys are all in the security studies program. You know that conflicts have consequences. So Libya was coming back. Now Libya is producing virtually nothing. Um, Iraq has shown a significant growth in production over the last few years. Uh, but uh, if ISIL has its way, uh, that production could be at risk. Uh, Great uncertainty. Uh, uh, Professor McNair and I were discussing this before at lunchtime. Um, great uncertainty about Iran. If Iran comes online, uh, what does that mean? Mid another uh, million barrels of, of production. So conflict ends up being a variable and uh, potentially uh, an important va variable. We mentioned Venezuela. <laughs> Venezuela, largest reserves in the world in our hemisphere, uh, but it is hard to imagine a country worse run uh, than Venezuela. So good news, you know, they could <coughs> produce through the wazoo. It's heavy oil, but U.S. refineries love heavy oil. So uh, uh, huge potential, but so badly mismanaged. Nigeria, another, another <coughs> Uh, great prospects, lousy management. So look at, uh, um, uh, look at some of these variables that will affect uh, what the future looks like. But the big number, the big number that you need, numbers that you need to keep in mind are 7.1 billion, current population of the world, 8.3 billion, another billion, by 2030 going to be another billion people driving their Hondas and uh, eating their beef, uh, both energy users. Uh, but that's almost a secondary number to one billion uh, people in the world who define themselves as middle class today. Uh, 2030, somewhere between two and three billion. Two and three double, maybe tripling uh, the number of middle class. Well, the thing about a middle class person is that they're no longer satisfied with the bicycle. They want the Honda. Um, and they're no longer satisfied with rice. Uh, they want beef and uh, pork and other things that are high energy users. So <clears throat> if, you look at, uh, if you look at those uh, demands, uh, you end up with the, I, uh, the EIA projection saying that between now and 2040, global demand for energy, global demand, will go up by roughly 38%. So um, if we were producing, uh, if the world is producing as it is now, roughly uh, consuming roughly 92 million barrels a day, 
you're looking at a number somewhere around 120 million barrels a day. And where is that increased production going to come from? Well, if you're uh, Chinese and optimistic, you say, well, it's going to come, some of it's going to come from Chinese shale. Um, and so that's a variable to be paying attention to. Uh, but others, um, um, uh, the rest, or much of the rest, is going to come from the Middle East, from OPEC. Exactly that part of the world that is today most vulnerable uh, to, uh, uh, to conflict. Uh, so, again, uh, um, um, EIA, OPEC oil producers, are the largest source of additional liquid fuel supply between 2010 and 2040. So those of you who say, and I'm sure no one in this room because you're all smart, um, we can forget about the Middle East because we're happy in our energy at home and uh, uh, global supply is so well distributed around the world that we don't need to think about the Middle East. Um, forget about that thought. The, uh, um, <coughs> um, roughly 30% um, of world maritime oil goes through the Straits of Hormuz. Um, 17 million barrels a day. And if you take 17 million barrels a day offline, you've got problems. Big problems for the global economy. So, uh, uh, so that's part of the story. But the other part of the story is, and as Tom mentioned, we've never been a heavy, we've never had heavy reliance on uh, the Middle East for oil. Um, but Europe has, Middle East, North Africa. Uh, but the other part of the story is this incredible shift of demand to Asia. So if you look at Saudi exports, you look at Kuwaiti exports, roughly 75%, 75% going to Asia. Uh, and so you've got a reorientation, if you will, of uh, of U.S. of uh, uh, Middle East energy towards Asia, linkages between Asia uh, and the Middle East, and so that is a uh, that is a change of consequence. And when you couple that with the Russian deal with China uh, for gas, you see a re reorientation going on uh, to Asia uh, that uh, uh, can be consequential for uh, for relationships. So let me quickly um, let me talk first of all about winners and losers from the current situation, and then close with some comments about the United States. So under the losers category, the Russians are getting hammered. Uh, they're getting hammered by low oil prices, by low energy prices. Uh, they're getting hammered by the free fall of the ruble down 40 or 50 percent. <coughs> Um, they're getting hammered by sanctions, and it's having virtually no effect on Putin's behavior. In fact, uh, the latest is that he's threatening to turn off Ukrainian gas, which means he's turning off German gas. Um, so um, Iran is hurt, hurt by sanctions. Um, but definitely hurt by low oil prices. Uh, they've got limits on what they can export, and uh, uh, now they're having to export those at a reduced, uh, a reduced price. Venezuela is, you know, sort of the poster child for failed and failing state, um, and they're uh, they're hurt. Uh, but countries like Nigeria and Angola are also hurt. So countries that export are, um, are being hurt by, uh, by lower price prices. Now, under the category of holding their own, uh, the Saudis, GCC, 
if you go to uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, Bank America savings account, uh, they've got $750 billion. So they can hang on with some lower prices for some period of time. And the Saudi strategy seems pretty transparent because they're talking about it. They want to drive down, uh, they want to drive out high cost producers. They think it's good news when the U.S. puts its rigs on the shelf. Uh, they think it's, uh, and moreover, what's not to like? Russians unhappy, Iranians not happy. I mean, two countries that, uh, uh, that the Saudis like to, uh, like to stick it to. Uh, so for the Saudis, multiple benefits, and the other GCC countries, Kuwait, UAE, and so on, uh, they've got cushions, and, uh, and they think they can ride this out rather than give up market share by cutting production. Um, the, uh, um, so, high cost producers read U.S. frackers, but Brazilian offshore, um, North Sea, um, all hurt by, by extremely low prices. Um, the winners from now are petroleum importers. India imports roughly 70% of its petroleum. They're really, really happy. Chinese, really happy by the low prices. Japan, Korea, uh, and then consumers uh, more generally. So finally, let me talk about the implications of all this for U.S. power and influence. There's an article that I would draw to your attention in the March-April edition of Foreign Affairs by Bob Blackwell and uh, Megan O'Sullivan entitled America's Energy Edge. <clears throat> in it, they posit that the huge boom, I'm quoting, huge boom in U.S. oil and gas production combined with the country's other enduring sources of military, economic, and cultural strength should enhance U.S. global leadership in the years to come. Now, in fairness to the two of them, they go on to say, uh, but only if Washington protects the sources of newfound strength at home and take advantage of new opportunities to protect its enduring interests abroad. Um, I suspect as they look at the disarray in the Congress today over homeland security, maybe some, some trepidation about that advice. But I think they've got the balance roughly right. Uh, the domestic U.S. energy revolution is good news uh, for the U.S., but it is, not, it is not a strategic game changer. There are clear benefits for the U.S. economy um, from this unconventional gas and oil revolution and particular, particular benefits for unconventional gas, uh, which is feedstock for a chemical industry that's being revived. Uh, companies are actually relocating back in the United States. It's, it means uh, jobs. Consumers clearly are getting a benefit from low, uh, low prices. But crude oil is a global commodity whose prices are subject to supply and demand. And as I noted, if the Straits of Hormuz are closed down, uh, that would be uh, hugely negative in its consequences. <coughs> it has been said that uh, second marriages represent the triumph of hope over experience. Um, I know most of you are not even into your first marriage, so here I'm talking about second marriages. But hope and experience. So uh, our experience has shown that the U.S. loves sanctions, but they rarely affect behavior in isolation. 
um, experience has shown that we're consistently terrible at assessing the commitment of our adversaries uh, to their goals, from North Vietnam uh, to Vladimir Putin. Experience has shown that we're particularly inept in factoring in religious motivations, in part because we believe in the separation of church and state and assume that everyone else should. Experience has shown that we too often think that unaddressed problems will uh, benefit by continued uh, benign neglect. Uh, and if you look at the numbers of centrifuges in Iran compared to uh, the Bush era, or you look at the number of settlements uh, in Israel uh, compared to uh, the 1990s, uh, you can appreciate that unaddressed problems can be consequential. Um, and experience has shown um, that uh, uh, we do need to make strategic choices uh, between priorities. Now, why do I go through uh, this list? <coughs> Seems to me that none of these imperatives, none of these imperatives is materially affected by virtue of this energy revolution. It is good news for the United States, uh, but it's not a game changer. It's good news that we will go from being an LNG, liquid fire, natural, natural gas importer, to being potentially an exporter. <clears throat> but it will not remove our uh, dependence on the global economy and on the global economy's dependence on the Middle East. Uh, it should, however, permit us to think anew in strategic terms about uh, two broad challenges confronting us. The first is the balance between domestic and foreign priorities. And I could run through for you uh, indicators of uh, such as poverty levels in this country, inequality, um, other factors that, uh, uh, that impede our, uh, our growth and prosperity. But for our purposes, I think it is sufficient to point out that today, 70% of the U.S. federal budget, actually a little more, uh, goes into payments to individuals. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, 70%. Uh, and the rest goes to discretionary. Defense, state, intelligence community, our whole national security establishment. And the trajectory is clear. That 70% is headed up and the 30% is headed down. And unless we can come to grips with that, our ability to play a consequential uh, role abroad diminishes rather than expands. And the second is the balance as between uh, regions of interest and of importance to the United States. So, putting aside Africa and Latin America, which I should say I don't believe we should, how do we divide our engagement in Europe, read Putin, in the Middle East, read Iceland, uh, or in Asia, read China? Um, Tom has heard me on this line. My, line has been that during the Bush administration we became, and really beginning in the Clinton administration, and including continuing into the Obama administration, we became, if I were thinking in business terms, we became overbought in Middle East equities. Our portfolio was out of balance. Um, 
I've been out of government for a year or so, so I, I don't know the exact number, but uh, I can tell you with great confidence that the number of, of uh, deputies committee meetings and principals meetings in the White House having to do with the Middle East versus Asia, uh, the former far outweighs the latter. We just spend a lot more presidential time on the Middle East than we do in Asia. Um, and so the president got it right in the first time, in the first term, when he said we need to rebalance to Asia. Uh, but now, like presidents before him, he's been sucked back into, uh, into the Middle East. And so not only do we have to deal with this, uh, with this balance question when it comes domestic versus foreign, we also need to figure out where the weight of our energies, to use a bad pun, the weight of our energies uh, are distributed between Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Asia. Let me stop there. Okay. I'm going to stay seated, mostly because my eyes are so bad I can't see my notes from four feet away, but I talk louder than Kaz, so you'll be able to hear me. Uh, and let me, let me focus in on oil and uh, start by making a little more explicit something that was implicit in what, what Kaz was saying. If you're an oil consumer, you confront a global market. The price of oil is, is, if you'll forgive the pun, crudely set by global supply and demand. There's variations for quality. There's, you know, you're going to pay transit costs. It's better to buy oil that's close by than far away. But the price is set roughly by supply and demand. Last year, the world produced just short of 93 million barrels of oil a day. It consumed just over 92 million barrels a day. And that's why the price dropped after June uh, over the last six months of the year. And Kaz went into why. I mean, you know, it's, it's Europe's flat, Japan's flat, uh, China. It's not just, a, and I think Kaz would agree with this, it's not just that China's growing less rapidly than we thought. The, the composition of China's economy is changing, too. It has to change. And it's, you know, it's moving out of really rough basic industries into more efficient industries. It's also moving into services which don't use nearly as much energy. So. Its demand for energy, even as it grows, is going, is going down. And that's, you know, so the world, meanwhile, on the supply side, the U.S. produced a lot of oil. Libya was back up on. Now, as Kaz says, it's off. Iraq is producing more oil. Uh, so, so there you have it. I, uh, in that, Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf continue to play an important place. And, it, it, you know, Saudi Arabia... And the United States, if you remember that bar graph, produced about the same amount of oil. That was 2013. I think last year it's even closer. The difference is we use our oil. The Saudis have two, three million barrels a day of oil production capacity that they, they could just stop using, or if they're not using it, that they can bring online. They are the global swing state. They got that way in the 1970s, and they continue to be that. Meanwhile, the, the Gulf itself, is, as Kat said, is, is putting about 25 to 30 percent of the, the world's oil out. Uh, unless there's pipelines, and there are some pipelines in the Middle East, uh, that's coming through the Strait of Hormuz. And if you shut down the Strait, you get a price spike, the likes of which you've, you've never seen before. And that just really perturbs the global economy. Uh, let me make some subsidiary points that may not be as, as obvious to you as, as that. The first is, it doesn't matter where you buy your oil. You know, I, and I say this because a, a very good friend of mine who is a Middle Eastern expert repeatedly says, you know, China has now come to, to rely on imports from the Persian, of oil from the Persian Gulf much more than the United States. The Persian Gulf is more important to China than it is to us. You know, you shut down the Strait of Hormuz, <coughs> you, you know, something happens to Saudi production, we're all going to feel that in the price of oil. The more important question, and this is why I put the, bar, the, uh, the pie charts up there, is how much of your economy is fueled by oil? And we actually happen to depend more on oil, 30, roughly a third of our economy, the Chinese roughly a fifth. Okay, so if anything, we're the ones that still depend more on the Persian Gulf, even though we, we never, you know, why would we buy oil from way up the hill, halfway around the world, you know, and you can get it nearby? Canada and Mexico. And by the way, when you're thinking of, of, of energy, you shouldn't think of the United States. Think about North America. We're increasingly a, an, an integrated energy whatever. 
you know, uh, 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 pipelines and so forth. So really, and think about, and I'll, I'll get to the reason why in a minute. Uh, even if we produce all the oil we need, or, or let's, even if North America <clears throat> produces all of the oil it needs, so in some sense we're self-sufficient, we're still going to pay the global price for that oil. Okay, now that's, that's, I don't think that rings true with many people on Capitol Hill who think that just approving the XL pipeline will completely change the nature of the world and our relationship to the Persian Gulf. Bullshit. Okay, I mean, you're, the reason it's a is... It's technical term. Yeah, it's a technical term that we use in the security field. The, the reason is Texas will charge you the market price unless you impose price controls, right? Bakken will charge you the market price. We tried price controls. We, we really are a capitalist country. We really are a democracy. We're not good at price controls. The results are disastrous. Much better to leave it to the markets. I think maybe China, which is used to controlling its economy, for better or for worse, maybe they could do something about that. Certainly countries subsidize energy, right? I mean, people pay a lot less for gas, Saudi Arabia, China, than, than the market price. Somebody's either paying for that as opportunity cost or actually paying for that as, as a the market price. So this, this notion that somehow we're going to become independent from the, the, the global oil market if we just raise enough oil is just, it's fanciful. Okay? We will all pay the price of, of, of what, what the Saudis decide about their, their oil production and what happens to the Persian Gulf. So for better or for worse, you know, we're, our security and our energy security in the oil area is linked uh, to the Persian Gulf. Now, let me let me develop from that some observations. The first is is let's let's talk about cooperation. All oil consumers have this same interest in the Persian Gulf, right? Okay. Now you don't see that very often. Most of the time, it's, it seems like we're way out in, in front, for better or for worse. On, on securing our interest in the Gulf. You, as some of you know, maybe all of you know, we always have an aircraft carrier around the Strait of Hormuz every day of the year. And if you're into sort of carrier allocation, that means about a third of our, our carrier force of 10 or 11 carriers, depending upon what the defense budget has in it this year, about a third are dedicated to the Persian Gulf, whatever the tilt to Asia, okay? Because if you have a carrier in the Gulf, you've got to have two others kind of messing around in the background. Okay, so, so we look like we're way out in front, but come a crisis, the, the other, the world's oil consumers come out. I remember I, when I was writing my book back in the 80s, it was the Iran-Iraq War. There's always a war. This was the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, and in the late part of the war, in 88, it looked like the war was about to spill over into the waters of the Gulf. Actually, this was in part Iraq's strategy to try and provoke Iran into attacking tankers, which would bring the United States and others into the war, and, and it actually worked. Uh, but by the time we set that up, five European oil consumers had their navies there with us, and we just divided up the Gulf and patrolled different parts of it. So in a crisis, you know, other oil consumers see their interests at stake, and they come out. The difference between 88 and today is China. In 88, China was still energy self-sufficient. In 93, it started to import energy, import oil. Now it's a huge oil consumer, and as Cass said, a lot of that oil is coming from the Persian Gulf. So we actually have a common interest with China in the security of Saudi Arabia, Strait of Hormuz, the Persian Gulf. I don't think either country is very comfortable with that observation. I think China in particular, you know, if you're, if you're raised in a communist system, the notion that such a strategic commodity of, as oil would be left to a market is just, you know, kind of, whoo! You know, and I, I've had conversations with Chinese officials who just still talk about controlling oil and the price of oil. Okay, good luck with that. Uh, they also, when they look out at, at the seas, they see the U.S. Navy. And they, and they see, you know, American majors drilling in Saudi Arabia. It just looks like a big U.S. conspiracy. You know, this is a big myth that the Americans pro propagate. Uh, and finally, when we're getting close to China's coast, you know, the, the, the first island chain, the South China Sea, there really is an emerging zero-sum game at the level of military planners, right? They, they're developing a navy that's designed to kind of push us out of that area 
air sea battle, which we've now changed to some anodyne expression that says nothing, is, is you know is our way of getting back in. That's that's really zero sum, and the danger is that the logic of military planning, which I'm all for, military planners should should do this, spreads out to the broader interaction of the U.S. and China in the world. So if you're the president and you're looking for conversations to have with China about common interests, you can have a big conversation, not just about oil and security. I mean, the Chinese don't have an interest in Iran getting a nuclear weapon. And they don't have an interest in Islamic terrorism running wild in the Middle East either. So there's layer upon layer of issues where we could have a, 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 a constructive conversation with China. I think we're probably trying to do that. I don't wander the halls of the State Department, but I, I imagine we're trying, and I imagine it's a tough road to hoe just, just for the reasons I said. What worries me is that there's, there's an increasingly zero-sum look uh, or perspective on sort of the military engagement in the Western Pacific, given what China's been buying, and, you know, and that's, that's allowable. What you want to do is contain that with a broader view of the areas in which we actually have a lot of things in common and we should be talking about it. So uh, if we're looking for a, a cooperative dialogue with China, uh, this is one of them. And, and frankly, although some of my friends in the Navy uh, you know, kind of blanch at this, if there's another crisis in the Persian Gulf where the tankers or the strait is, is threatened, we should want the Chinese Navy to be there. And, and uh, you know, we, we got them over in the, you know, off the coast of Yemen and, and Somalia working on piracy, but oil is far more important than that. Okay, so that's, that's one big conclusion. Now let's focus on security in the Persian Gulf. Uh, you know, when I was writing my book in 85, it was a dicey time. The Shah had fallen about a year or two before I started writing and started working. The Soviets had invaded Afghanistan. It's hard to, for you to realize looking back, but in the early... Uh, 80s, we saw that as a, we, the hawks, <laughs> the, the, the deep hawkish community saw that as the beginning of the Soviet Union's advance to Bandar, uh, Bandar Abbas and taking over the Strait of Hormuz. I, I kid you not. It, it looks kind of frivolous looking back, but in 1983 and 4, you know, they had divisions right there in the southwest corner of Afghanistan and they were ready to jump into uh, Iran and, and uh, control the world's. Uh, the world's oil. That, so it was a dicey time, but at least you could have that conversation in terms of states, right? Iraq, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Yemen. Yemen was two states, then it became one state. Now it's four states. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's a no state. But at least you could talk about states, and in particular, you could you could actually talk about the balance of power. You had. At the north end of the Gulf, you had Iran and Iraq at war with one another. Iran's a much bigger country, population-wise, but still, you know, Iraq drafts twice as many, or drafted back then twice as many people. As long as they were confronting one another, they left the Saudis free to make their own decisions about oil. And so the Iran-Iraq balance was a very important part of my overall strategic concept. I look at it today and everything is just gone to hell. Right? I mean, the, the, you can't have this conversation in terms of states. From Lebanon all the way across to Iraq, it's mush. And most importantly, Iran now really has come over into Baghdad and the Tigris and Euphrates valleys and, and looks down from the north on Saudi Arabia, which, among other things, makes the Saudis extremely uncomfortable. Okay? Now, the first thing to notice is we're responsible for this. <laughs> you know, you invade a country, bump off the ruler without the slightest plan on how to stabilize the country when you're done with that. And this is what you get, okay? Uh, but the Saudis are responsible for this too in the sense that, you know, when they look at ISIS or they look at Al-Qaeda, they're seeing all Wahhabism, the Wahhabism the very xenophobic form of Islam that, that was used to construct Saudi Arabia a hundred and some years ago, they see that coming back at them. It's been amped up, distorted, but it's coming back at them. So this is a very del delicate area where you, you, know, you do something. Remember, we talk about luck and chance in war. Uh, you do something, the ripple effects of, of what you do uh, are, are potentially very perverse. Now, I mean, presidents know that, right? They don't want anything to do with this part of the world. Uh, I mean, you, you think about Clinton. Uh, 
<coughs> we, we pull out of Afghanistan when the Cold War ends, turn our backs on the place. We fire the occasional cruise missile into an al Qaeda training camp, but otherwise we just draw a big line around Afghanistan. That's their problem. <coughs> Until 9-11, when it becomes our problem. Okay. Then you get Bush, who actually campaigns in the same way. This is not our problem. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just not going to get into this state building stuff. Do, you, do any of you remember Bush's campaign rhetoric in 2000? <laughs> I mean, he contradicted everything uh, about two years later. You know, Bush does the opposite. He jumps in with both feet. Not only invades Afghanistan with no plan there, but he invades Iraq with no, no plan there. And so we, we get in with both feet. And, and that has enormously negative ripple effects. It was once said that the invasion of Afghanistan was the most important recruiting tool we ever gave to Al, Al Qaeda. Now we get Obama, who really wants to go back to zero. Right? He wanted to get out of Iraq. Now I realize there's a debate about whether we could have stayed in Iraq, and I've, I've heard very informed people argue both sides of this. I, I guess I'm of the school uh, uh, that says if we really wanted to stay, we could have. We would have found a formula for staying. But I, there's some people I deeply respect who, who would disagree with that. But Obama doesn't want to stay. He wants out, and he wanted out of Afghanistan as well. So in a sense, we've gone from too cold to too hot. And, and if Obama's back in, what we're really looking for, I mean, we prove by trying to get out of the region that it's not a region that can correct its own problems. It needs us. But it needs us in a somewhat, I, what I call the Goldilocks strategy. You know, not too hot, <coughs> not too cold, somewhere in between. Okay, we're going to be a part of this. Okay, what is this? Well, if you hit you know, the president, it's destroying ISIS. I, you know, we can't even destroy the Ku Klux Klan in this country. You know, you marginalize ISIS. You know, you, I mean, we're, you know, radical groups don't go away. They just shrink to a point where they become a kind of a minor 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 problem. I think the goal is state building. State building. And state building takes <coughs> a long, long time. I think the best example of state building in our history is South Korea, 50, 60 years. So, so instead of trying to get out of the Persian Gulf, why don't we just reconcile ourselves to staying in some form and trying to help in any way we can. Now, right now, we're, we're using air power both to, to buy time, keep ISIS kind of weak, but also, I think more importantly, to force Maliki out of Baghdad and, and to, to bring a body in and, and try to create a more inclusive regime in Baghdad. Okay? I mean, I, I don't think the Iraqi army collapsed in the West because of incompetence. I think if you're a Sunni in Anbar, you don't know where to turn, right? Baghdad's Maliki, it's all Shia. ISIS is at least Sunni, except that they'll cut your head off if you don't write, say the right things. Uh, they're just stuck. If you could create an inclusive regime in Baghdad, and, and you'd say a body is sort of moving in that direction, but this is going to be a long process. I, I don't think we as Americans understand the depths of Shia paranoia <coughs> in Iraq. I mean, these guys suffered for decades under Saddam. They, I, I, they're so paranoid that I, I think they, they think Saddam's really alive. He's in a basement in Tikrit, and he's just waiting for the chance to come back. So you don't ever take the lid off that. And that's sort of the way Mal Maliki behaves. Our presence reassures them a little bit, and that's one of the reasons I would like to, uh, to abstain. So <coughs> the first thing we do is we, we use our military power to begin to reconstruct Iraq. I don't have a strategy for Syria. Neither does the president, but he's not going to say that ever again, right? Because you get such a fuss from people when you admit <coughs> what, what is true. Uh, and I don't have a strategy for Yemen. But if you see this as a long-term strategy, remember what we teach in 501. <coughs> strategy isn't something you set down. You have to have a vision of where you want to go. And, and then, you know, you, you start. And everything goes differently than what you planned, right? I mean, the enemy gets a vote, fog friction, all the things you learn about in 501, so you adapt. Okay, we're there. We're beginning to work on the one part of the problem we can actually have leverage over. Uh, we wait for an opening in Syria. Maybe we start a low-grade uh, low process of building up moderate uh, Islamist forces. Boy, I don't know. I think with, with Yemen, actually Barbara Bodine ought to come over from the Institute and talk because she was our ambassador there. Uh, it's never been a very well-organized country, so you, 
you, you look for opportunities there. I, I don't have solutions here. What I'm saying is the mentality has to be get over trying to get out of this place. It's very important to us, no matter how much oil we lift, and, and it's evidently can't fix itself without a little help from us. Just you got to be careful about how you do that. Okay, so on the Arab side of the Gulf, state building is the issue. On the Iranian side of the Gulf, containment or balancing Iranian power is the issue. And you'd have to say, we're not doing a real good job of this. But, but if you can <coughs> reconstruct an Iraqi state that is inclusive, you begin to move back to where the Gulf was when I was writing about it in the, in the early 80s. That is, I mean, I think a reconstructed Iraq is going to become less and less a client state of Iran and more and more Iraq. And, and, you know, Saddam thought, I mean, the reason he was surprised that Bush went after him was, I, I'm protecting your interests here in the Gulf. I realize I'm a nasty person, but I am the Eastern like of the Arab world, and I'm doing this for you. And, frankly, he was. <clears throat> that, both of that, those statements were true. Nasty person uh, protecting the eastern flank of the Gulf. If we can reconstruct an Iraqi state, we are beginning to contain Iran. In fact, state building is the only way you're going to ultimately contain uh, Iran. And that brings me to the, uh, <coughs> the present uh, situation where we're, we're a month away from a nuclear uh, agreement or not. Uh, I, maybe a Goldilocks solution is, is the way to talk about this too. On the one hand, you have, you know, uh, squeeze them with sanctions and if they don't get rid of their capability, bomb them. Okay. I'm not a fan of bombing. Uh, you know, it's partly because I, I make some of you know, I was a mobilized reservist in the Gulf War back in 1991. At Christmas <coughs> of 1990, we had our big war planning session, and, and the Air Force came in and said, we know every nuclear target in Iran, or in Iraq, and we have enough bombs to just blow it all back to the Stone Age. We hit about 50% of the targets. The other 50% we didn't know about. I don't ever believe people, and don't ever, you ever believe people. <coughs> I mean, don't get me off on it. Uh, you know, when they, when they say we know everything, I don't know what the target set in Iran is, and I don't believe anybody who says they do. So first problem is we're not going to hit the whole target set. Second of all, we're not bombing Iran, we're declaring war on Iran. And they have, they get a vote, and they have lots of different ways to, to lodge that, that vote. And third, we're just, we're just convincing them that what they're doing is exactly what they need to do, get a nuclear weapon. So you buy a little time, maybe, you buy yourself another war, just doesn't make any sense to me. So that's too hot. Uh, it is said that the Obama administration is looking for the opposite, rapprochement with Iran. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not an Iranian expert. I think it's a little early for that. I think you still have a revolutionary regime here that owns an enormous amount of the economic assets in, in Iran. They took it over in 79 and 80, and they still have it. So they have a, a powerful stake in the status quo. But, but they also have a stake in having the great Satan around to, to help them consolidate their power. I, I, I'm not sure that we're ready for a rapprochement. Uh, I don't know what the nuclear agreement's going to look like. I'm willing to not have one and just continue with the sanctions and look for a better agreement. It'll, it'll be hard <coughs> to manage that. But I, I, don't, I think I agree with Khamenei. Uh, no agreement is better than, than a bad agreement, and I'm just not sure what this agreement uh, is going to look like. So uh, just to, to draw some conclusions, first of all, energy independence, so far as oil is concerned, is a myth, uh, in my view. Now, I can imagine some technologies, you know, like, if, Solar power. Suddenly, somebody invents a solar cell that, even on a cloudy day, you know, powers everything within 100 yards of where you're standing. Your house, your car. You know, I, I mean, there are some technologies that may yet prove. But as long as 30% of our energy mix is oil, we're tied to the Persian Gulf, okay, and the price of oil, which is mostly set by what happens there. So, so forget about energy independence. I just don't think it's, uh, uh, it's. It, it, I think it's a fanciful notion. Second of all, start thinking about the Middle East not as a place to escape, as complicated as, as it is, but as a place where we're going to be engaged for a long, long time. And, and we've got to modulate that engagement because we're, we're toxic, we're helpful and we're toxic, and we've got to kind of walk a fine line between those. I actually think what Obama has done so far is, is about right, which puts me at odds with just about everybody else on the Hill and a lot of other places, because I think he's struggling to find sort of 
a, a, a place to be. I, I don't think U.S. ground forces can win this. I think Iraqi ground forces have to reconstruct the Iraqi state. And I think Arab <coughs> forces have to reconstruct the Middle East. I think we can help in, in many ways. And it's not just military. There are a lot of other things we can do uh, with state, state building. So stop trying to leave and, and use more than just military tools to get at that. And with that, I'll stop. And Cass and I will have whatever discussion, discussion with whatever time there is left.